This is my desktop workstation. As you can, oh, let's open it. As you can probably see, this doesn't exactly have the best cooling layout. So temps could and are a problem for things like this cheap pre-built looking case with a CPU cooled by nothing more than an Intel stock cooler. But maybe we can alleviate that with a simple setting that you can probably do yourself if you also have this overheating problem. If you're just here to drop your temps, here's a super quick guide. This is mostly directed to Intel CPUs, though the same thing could be achieved with AMD CPUs using Ryzen Master. More on that later. First, download Intel's Extreme Tuning Utility. You can search for it on Google, or you can also just click the link in the video description for the download. Next, install and then open the program. Go to the side menu and make sure you are on Advanced Tuning. Then go to All Controls or Core. Find the Core Voltage Offset setting and then either use the slider or the drop-down menu to select a value. Set it to something negative. I would recommend using negative 0.05V as the starting point for your reference. On the right side of the screen are the values that XCU has loaded, and you should see the value you put on that setting menu reflected on the proposed values. Click Apply and it should be on the actual value settings and voila, you're done. No reboots, no hardware changes, just a simple menu change in software. To explain what we just did, we need to understand how CPU voltages work. A CPU is just like any other electronic component in that it consumes power when in use. This power consumption is obviously measured in watts. If you paid attention to your science class, you will know that power watts is equivalent to voltage volts multiplied by the current, which is amps. CPUs are no exception. Now, usually the current is dictated by how by the frequencies that the CPU runs at and there's really not much control if at all in modern CPUs for the currents that they run at. What you can control though is voltage. Typically CPUs run in a range between sub 1 volt to about at the extreme 1.5 volts and the higher the voltage the higher the frequencies a CPU can sustain but the hotter it will be and the more power it will consume. That's a massive oversimplification of the problem but that's essentially what's going on. You want to keep voltages as low as possible while still being high enough to maintain stability. But you might notice that we didn't specify a core voltage. We specified an offset. That difference is very important for good reason. Modern CPUs have gotten so good at scaling their frequencies depending on the load that they can go from sub 1 gigahertz at idle to well over 5 gigahertz under load within a couple of seconds. Modern CPUs are so good at dynamic frequencies these days that setting a voltage that is fixed at a single value is kind of inefficient, which is why by default most CPUs have adaptive voltages. Adaptive voltages are based on a volts frequency curve as provided by the motherboard's BIOS that the CPU is attached to. It essentially dictates what voltage a CPU will run at what clock speed it can hit. So for example, 1.25 at 4.5 gigahertz, for example. This makes sense. Setting a fixed voltage will limit the range of these dynamic frequencies and make them much more inefficient or unstable depending on the, if they're on idle or at load. This is all in the name of efficiency. Well, mostly. Efficiency should not come at the cost of stability and those default curve values usually have a buffer or overhead in them, which means that they are running slightly higher voltages than what most CPUs need. On the surface, this sounds dumb, but it's a worthwhile trade-off for the fact that every CPU can run at that 
platform. Thanks to Silicon Lottery, there will be some CPUs that won't pass the bidding process or just barely, which means that they will require higher voltages than their more bin counterparts. But of course, not every CPU is like that. And in fact, thanks to the fact that CPU binning is essentially a standard distribution curve, most CPUs will not need the higher voltages that the motherboard gives them. This is where our offset comes in. By setting an offset, we are essentially shifting the entire voltage curve up or down depending on the value. For example, if you set that 0.05 millivolt offset into the same 4.5 gigahertz CPU that runs it at 1.25 volts, it will shift that voltage along with the other voltage with a given frequency down by 0.05 volts, meaning that it will only run at 1.2 volts at that same 4.5 gigahertz frequency. This in turn decreases power consumption and temperatures. Enough of those INC stuff though, just how much of a difference would that actually make? Well, I've undervolted this system to around negative 110 millivolts offset for about a month now and the results are pretty interesting indeed. I've run a test comparing it to stock with default voltages and power limits and a limits remove test, which makes the power limit one equal to power limit two. I'll explain more in a little bit. I ran it on my desktop with the following specifications and I used Cinebench R23 with a 10 minute minimum test duration to put a long, fairly heavy load on the system. First, the results of the test. The stock setting scored at 5,008 points after just over 10 minutes and four passes of the render. Changing the power limits has a significant 6% increase in performance, scoring 5,340 after 12 minutes and five passes of the render. Using the 110 millivolt offset without changing any of the power limits has it slightly higher than that, but statistically still within margin of error. Still, the fact that you can increase performance by undervolting the CPU is rather interesting. Maybe our clock speeds can help explain that. Looking at our average effective clocks, we can see the difference in how long the tests were run. As I said before, the stock did just over 10 minutes to complete four passes, while both our limits removed and undervolt test did five passes in just over 12 minutes. This is due to the fact that the other two were about 6% faster to complete each render, and thus can do slightly more renders than our stock configuration. And you can probably already see why. You can see that while the limits removed and undervolted tests ran at essentially 3.8 gigahertz specs throughout the passes, our stock configuration bounced back and forth between 3.7 and 3.8 gigahertz, usually sustaining slightly below 3.75 gigahertz. To explain this, we have to zoom in on the first pass of the test. Interesting. The stock configuration did maintain a lock 3.8 gigahertz, but only for a little bit. In fact, if you count it, it's about 56 seconds, which if you recall, is the default tau or boosting time limit. After that, it drops down to 3.75, which is the frequency that it tries to maintain throughout the rest of the test. The reason for this is those power limits that I was talking about. There are two relevant values here. PL1 and PL2, with PL standing for power limit. PL2 is the higher value, which is the most amount of power a CPU will consume under boost. PL1 is the lower value, which is the highest a CPU will normally sustain when boost has been disengaged. The boosting time is tau, as we said before, and defaults to 56 seconds. The stock configuration has a 65 watt PL1 and a 122 watt PL2. So that's for context. We can see this clearly in our package power graph, where during tau stock was reaching the same package power as limits removed, but then drops to just under the 65 watt power limit. The limits removed, meanwhile, continues on as its power limit one is equal to power limit two, which is 122 watts meaning that it will continue to boost as high as it can until it hits a thermal limit. But recall that our undervolt also reached 
the same frequency and the same if not slightly higher performance with the same stock power limit behavior. Looking at the graph though, it all makes sense since the undervolt. The CPU is well under the 65 watt power limit and in fact consistently drew under 55 watts for the same clock speed as our limits removed. Peak to peak, our undervolt was about 17 watts lower than both our stock configuration and limits removed configuration, at around 69 to 70 watts peak for both. Though when comparing sustained, the stock again only sustained 65 watts on average. This has the undervolt at about 25% lower power consumption than limits removed for the same performance and about 20% lower than the stock configuration for about 6 to 7% more performance. A quick efficiency calculation shows that the undervolt is 40% more efficient than both stock and limits removed. That's a noticeable increase in efficiency and will have an impact on your electricity bill if you use your CPU for these kinds of heavy tasks regularly. The limits removed and stock had about the same efficiency, with limits removed being technically worse but is still within margin of error. All of this of course translates to what we really came in for, thermals. With a stock cooler, the stock configuration ramped up to 85 degrees max during boost before going down to 82 and 83 degrees after PL2 disengaged. It slowly crept back up to 85 degrees as it got further into the test thanks to heat soak and near the end of it hovered at around 87 to 88 degrees. This is not great, but it's still at least better than the limits removed, which had about the same initial ramp curve but heated up quicker and for longer as it tried to maintain 70 watts at 3.8 gigahertz. By the end of the test, it was running above 90 degrees. Our undervolt, meanwhile, ramped up to 75 degrees and stayed there for most of the run, though heat soak did push it up to 76 and 77 degrees near the end of the test. Peak to peak then, the undervolt is about 12% or 10 degrees lower than stock and a whopping 18% or 16 degrees cooler than limits removed. That's a pretty huge delta and can mean the difference from thermal throttling to running just fine in a suffocated case environment. A quick disclaimer here again, do this at your own risk. If you're undervolted your system too hard, it might become unstable or even crash. I initially ran this actually at one at negative 125 millivolt offset, and while it did pass Cinebench and the other hard but not very long, like up to one hour long test just fine, after a few hours of use, it just randomly crashed. So I had to back it off and eventually a negative 110 millivolt offset was where I landed. As Der Bauer once said, you can't really prove stability. You can only prove instability. And so trying to run this thing and get it to stable is essentially just trying to find the setting where it won't crash. As a general rule of thumb, 50 millivolt, negative 50 millivolts should be a pretty good starting point for most CPUs for a nice and easy undervolt. Though, if you want to optimize it, incrementing that up by 25 millivolts and then until it crashes and then going down by about 5 millivolt offsets is probably the way to go. If you have a weekend to waste, you can play around with it and use some gaming or some long heavy use workloads that isn't really important to you to see if the system is stable or not. You can also just use a stress test to run it overnight or even for a couple of days just to be sure, but personally I didn't really bother and the negative 110 millivolt did just fine. As for laptops in AMD, well, actually, it's a bit complicated. For AMD systems, Ryzen Master is the XCU equivalent, and you can even set the voltage curve by yourself, so that's pretty handy. For Intel laptops, this used to be possible on most, if not all of them, but starting 12 Starting 10th gen, Intel removed that functionality or at least locked it down due to the Pundervolt vulnerability. And so, undervolting using XTU on Intel Mobile isn't really a thing, at least for laptops that are like 10th gen and newer. For AMD laptops, <laughs> man, 
I think it's even worse. Ryzen Mobile is not supported on Ryzen Master, and most tuning utilities are either for Zen 2 and up, and are mostly just power limit controls. Ryzen controller, which is FOSS by the way, is a great example of this. And while it's good that the open source community is, cares about this stuff and actually makes these components and software available to the public for free, it doesn't really help the undervolting problem. It makes it practically impossible unless you have a system that specifically supports it or you are a true enthusiast. Which is a shame, really, because as you just saw, it can make a big difference. Now, laptop manufacturers will argue that they tune the CPU to be as fast and as cool as possible themselves, and that users should probably just stay away from that stuff. And in most parts, they're correct. But having that functionality when you absolutely need it, like when your laptop is literally thermal throttling, is, well, it should exist. And even if they don't recommend it, they should at least have support for it. There are dangers to it, as with any modification to your system, obviously. But an undervolted system is often cooler and in some ways even per more performant than normal ones, which is a golden combination that most people is willing to strive for. So, yeah.